Now it cannot be maintained even that by the crawling system the greatest amount of truth would be attained in any long series of ages, for the repression of imagination was an evil not to be compensated for by any superior certainty in the ancient modes of investigation. The error of these ju of these Germains, these Rinch, these English, these Americans, the latter, by the way, were our own immediate progenitors, was an error quite analogous with that of the wiseacre, who fancies that he must necessarily see an object the better the more closely he holds it to his eyes. These people blinded themselves by details. When they proceeded hoggishly, their facts were by no means always facts, a matter of little consequence, had it not been for assuming that they were facts and must be facts because they appeared to be such. When they proceeded on the path of the ram, of course, their co when they proceeded on the path of the ram, their course was scarcely as straight as a ram's horn, for they never had an axiom which was an axiom at all. They must have been very blind not to see this, even in their own day. For even in their own day, many of the long-established axioms had been rejected. For example, ex nihilo nihil fit, a body cannot act where it is not, there cannot exist antipodes, darkness cannot come out of light, all these, and a dozen other similar propositions formerly admitted without hesitation as axioms, were, even at the period of which I speak, seen to be untenable. How absurd in these people, then, to persist in putting faith in axioms as immutable bases of truth. But even out of the mouths of their soundest reasoners, it is easy to demonstrate the futility, the impalpability of their axioms in general. Who was the soundest of their logicians? Let me see. I will go and ask Pundit, and be back in a minute. Ah, here we are, have it. Here is a book written nearly a thousand years ago and lately translated from the English, which, by the way, appears to have been the rudiment of the American. Pundit says it is decidedly the cleverest ancient work on its topic, logic. The author, who was much thought of in his day, was one Miller, or Mill, and we find it recorded of him as a point of some importance that he had a Mill horse called Bentham. But let us glance at the treatise. Ah, ability or inability to conceive, says Mr. Mill very properly, is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth. What modern in his senses would ever think of disputing this truism? The only wonder with us must be how it happened that Mr. Mill conceived it necessary to even to hint at anything so obvious. So far good, but let us turn over another paper. What have we here? Contradictories cannot both be true, that is, cannot coexist in nature. Here Mr. Mill means, for example, that a tree must be either a tree or not a tree, that it cannot be at the same time a tree and not a tree. Very well, but I ask him why. His reply is this, and never pretend to be anything else than this, because it is impossible to conceive that contradictories can be both true. But this is no answer at all, by his own showing. For has he not just admitted as a truism that ability or inability to conceive is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth? Now I do not complain of these ancients so much because their logic is, by their own showing, utterly baseless, worthless, and fantastic altogether, as because of their pompous and imbecile prescription of all other roads of truth, of all other means for its attainment than the two preposterous paths the one of creeping and the one of crawling, to which they have dared to confine the soul that loves nothing so well as to soar. By the by, my dear friend, do you not think it would have puzzled these ancient dogmaticians to have determined by which of their two roads it was that the most important and most sublime of all truths was in effect attained? I mean the truth of gravitation. Newton owned it to Kepler. Newton owed it to Kepler. Kepler admitted that his three laws were guessed at, these three laws of all laws which led the great English mathematician to his principle, the basis of all physical principle, 
to go behind which we must enter the kingdom of metaphysics, Kepler guessed, that is to say, imagined. He was essentially a theorist, that word now of so much sanctity, formerly an epithet of contempt. Would it not have puzzled these old moles, too, to have, to have explained by which of the two roads a cryptographist unriddles a cryptograph? of more than usual secrecy, or by which of the two roads Champollion directed mankind to those enduring and almost innumerable truths which resulted from his deciphering the hieroglyphs? One word more on this topic, and I will be done boring you. It is not passing strange that, with their eternal prattling about roads to truth, these bigoted people missed what we now so clearly perceive to be the great highway, that of consistency? Does it not seem singular how they should have failed to deduce from the works of God the vital fact that a perfect consistency must be an absolute truth? How plain has been our progress since the late announcement of this proposition? Investigation has been taken out of the hands of the ground molds and given as a task to the true and only true thinkers, the men of ardent imagination. These latter theorize. These latter theorize. Can you not fancy the shout of scorn with which my words would be received by our progenitors were it possible for them to be now looking over my shoulder? These men say theorize, and their theories are simply corrected, reduced, systematized, cleared little by little of their dross inconsistency, until finally a perfect consistency stands apparent which even the most stolid admit because it is a consistency, to be an absolute and an unquestionable truth. April 4th. The new gas is doing wonders in conjunction with the new improvement with gutta percha. How very safe, commodious, manageable, and in every respect convenient are our modern balloons. Here is an immense one, approaching us at the rate of at least 150 miles an hour. It seems to be crowded with people, perhaps there are three or four hundred passengers, and yet it soars to an elevation of nearly a mile, looking down upon poor us with sovereign contempt. Still, a hundred or even two hundred miles an hour is slow traveling after all. Do you remember our flight on the railroad across the Canada continent? Fully three hundred miles an hour. That was traveling. Nothing to be seen, though. Nothing to be done but flirt, feast, and dance mag in, in the magnificent saloons. Do you remember what an odd sensation was experienced when, by chance, we saw we caught a glimpse of external objects while the cars were in full flight? Every thing seemed unique in one mass. For my part, I cannot say but that I preferred the traveling by the slow train of a hundred miles an hour. Here we were permitted to have glass windows, even to have them open, and something like a distinctive view of the country was attainable. Pundit says that the route for the Great Canada Railroad must have been in some measure marked out about 900 years ago. In fact, he goes so far as to assert that actual traces of a road are still discernible, traces referable to a period quite as remote as that mentioned. The track, it appears, was double only. Ours, you know, was twelve paths, and three or four new ones are in preparation. The ancient rails are very slight and placed so close together as to be, according to modern notions, quite frivolous, if not dangerous in the extreme. The present width of track, fifty feet, is considered indeed scarcely secure enough. For my part, I make no doubt that a track of some sort must have been must have existed in very remote times, as Pundit asserts, for nothing can be clearer to my mind than that at some period not less than seven centuries ago, certainly, the northern and southern Canada continents were united. The, Canad the Canadians, then, would have been driven, by necessity, to a great railroad across the continent. April 5th. I am almost devoured by ennui. Pundit is the only conversable person on board, and he, poor soul, can speak of nothing but antiquities. He has been occupied all the day in the attempt to convince me that the ancient Americans governed themselves. Did ever anybody hear of such an absurdity? 
that they existed in a sort of every-man-for-himself confederacy after the fashion of the prairie dogs that we read of in fable. He says that they started with the queerest idea conceivable, viz. that all men are born free and equal. This, in the very teeth of the laws of predation, so visibly impressed upon all things, both in the moral and physical universe. Every man voted, as they call it, as they called it. That is to say, meddled with public affairs, until at length it was discovered that what is everybody's business is nobody's, and that the republic, so the absurd thing was called, was without government at all. It is related, however, that the first circumstance which disturbed very particularly the self-complacency of the philosophers who constructed this republic was the startling discovery that universal suffrage gave opportunity for fraudulent schemes by means of which any desired number of votes might at any time be polled without the possibility of prevention or even detection by any party which should be merely villainous enough not to be ashamed of the fraud. A little reflection upon this discovery sufficed to render evident the consequences which were that rascality must predominate, in a word, that a republican government could never by anything but a rascally one be, could never be anything by a rascally one, but a, in a word, that a republican government could never be anything but a rascally one. While the philosophers, however, were busied in blushing at their stupidity in not having foreseen these inevitable evils, and intent upon the invention of new theories. The matter was put to an abrupt issue by a fellow of the name of Mob, who took everything into his own hands and set up a despotism, in comparison with which those of the fabulous Zeros and Helifagabaluses were respectable and delectable. This Mob, a foreigner, by the by, is said to have been the most odious of all men that ever encumbered the earth. He was a giant in stature, insolent, rapacious, filthy, had the gall of a bullock with the heart of a hyena and the brains of a peacock. He died, at length, by dint of his own energies, which exhausted him. Nevertheless, he had his uses as everything has, however vile, and taught mankind a lesson, which is to say, which is which to this day it is in no danger of forgetting, never to run directly contrary to the natural analogies. As for republicanism, no analogy could be found for it upon the face of the earth, unless we accept the case of the prairie dogs, an exception which seems to demonstrate, if anything, that democracy is a very admirable form of government for dogs. April 6th. Last night had a fine view of Alpha Lyrae. Alpha Lirai, whose disc through our captain's spy glasses, whose disc through our captain's spy glass subtends an angel. April sixth. Last night had a fine view of Alpha Lirai, whose disc through our captain's spy glass subtends an angle of half a degree, looking very much as our sun does to the naked eye on a misty day. Alpha Lirai, although so very much larger than our sun, by the by resembles him closely as regards its spots, its atmosphere, and in many other particulars. It is only within the last century, Pundit tells me, that the binary relation existing between these two orbs began even to be suspected. <laughs>